this show this uh, webinar so if you want to um, see it again we can send you a link to that and you can see particularly how to make the the, the, the mammal trapping tool the mammal watching tool and um, you can see that later on okay so um, enough of the preamble let's get started so Jan as you can see I've got my sleuths hat on I am ready to find out how to spot wildlife and how to be a nature detective um, and if, if we, we're out there we're in our garden or in the park and we want to go and search for some wildlife what is it we should be looking out for? How do we know what to see? Okay, so we've got a PowerPoint for this run through. I just want to say before I start that um, I've got three dogs in the house and nobody to stop them if they decide they're going to bark because somebody's delivering a parcel. So if you do hear background noise, I apologise, but they're all very quiet at the moment. So I hope it will stay that way. Okay. okay Martin. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, many wild creatures are shy and nocturnal, which can make them difficult to see. However, they often leave signs that show that they live or have visited an area. So field evidence like tracks, droppings, burrows, nests, feeding signs, etc. can indicate their presence. It is a big subject and one which can take years to learn. So today we're going to make a start by looking at a few simple ways you can become a nature detective. So we have eight top things to look out for today, for which I'm going to talk about. Remember, you have five senses, so we will be using four of these, sight, hearing, touch and smell. So have them at the ready. Okay, so should we look at the first slide? Next slide, sorry, Martin. Um, I need to move them as well. Sorry, I've just got to move my slide on. I'm on a different one. Uh, so these are the things that you'll need, not many things, apart from obviously your senses. Uh, a magnifying glass could be handy, um, a helpful guide of tracks and signs, collection boxes or specimen jars. So if we could have the next one please, Martin. So number one is footprints. So if you see footprints in the mud, sand or snow, this is a sure sign that creatures have been about. And if you learn to identify whose footprints belong to who, um, or carry an identification chart with you, um, you, you can see, who, see what creatures have passed by. Uh, there are plenty of useful guides, which we'll talk about later. Next slide, please, Martin. Uh, so number two is looking for poo. All animals poo. So looking at the characteristics of droppings you find will help you detect what animals have been about. These two creatures are insectivores, um, the pipistrel bat and the hedgehog. Their poos will often um, have pieces of shiny insect fragments in them and you will find bat poo beneath roosts. It is found there in large quantities as it builds up over time. Hedgehogs poo quite randomly around their territory and it's said to smell like linseed and this is what their poo looks like. Okay, next one, please. Um, herbivores droppings are generally round and often with visible plant remains in them. They often deposit them in large quantity. Um, wood mice droppings are not dissimilar to that of bats, as you can see by the picture there. So detect, detecting who the owner is means that you will need to pay close attention um, to what they actually look like you will need your magnifying glass to look at them really closely. Also think about where you are, look up and ask yourself, could this be a bat roost? Or is it more likely to be a place where mice live? Or, or maybe it could be both. Um, next one, please, Martin. Yep. So, uh, oh, sorry, I've gone too far with mine just a sec. So we're talking about carnivores now. Uh, so their droppings are either long, frequently twisted, contain bone, fur or feather, or well, they may be shapeless and sloppy, so they can be very variable, which make, might make them a bit more okay, so difficult Jan, to is identify. There, is there, a, Jan, is there a, like a difference? Can you tell a carnivore from its droppings? Could you say, oh, that's a long dropping and therefore that's a carnivore and the little roundy ones are uh, uh, yeah. or something? Well, I think they all, they're all quite varied. I mean, if you look, look at the otter there, it's got quite a lot of bones and fish bones in it. Yeah. Uh, Badger is very sloppy um, and I, I think this is about being the nature detective and really learning, learning about your poo and which ones look like which and what they smell like and that sort of thing. 
Um, so not a, there's not especially, they have the characteristics that I've mentioned, they often contain bones and they can be very sloppy, whereas a herbivore would never have a sloppy poo <laughs> because they're eating a lot of fibre. Oh, right. <laughs> so that's, that's perhaps the biggest giveaway, if it's a sloppy poo that it's a carnivore. <laughs> um, so, um, so they also tend to deposit their droppings in prominent places because they like to sort of show off that they're around and mark their territory with them. Um, and that's a very strong smelling, that works very well. So um, and herbivore, herbivore, herbivores don't, don't mark their territory with their poo then, is that, that's, that's another thing? No, no, not very territorial really. I mean, I suppose in different ways, like deer will hold harems, but they tend to just fight with other males rather than leave smells about the place, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Right, okay. Um, so badgers, um, they have communal latrines, which they, they oh, you put burrows on now. Yeah. I hadn't finished with that one, really, but never oh, mind. Sorry, Chad. <laughs> so, oh, right. I was just going to say, because it's quite interesting, really, that badgers have uh, communal latrines, um, and, and they, they, they poo all in one place um, near to their sets. Okay. Um, and, Rab, sorry, I'm, I'm, you're confusing me as to which slide I'm on here. That's better. So, foxes poo quite randomly, but it's very, very smelly stuff, so they tend to leave it around their territory. And then, as I mentioned, otter poo is full of bones. And um, stoats and weasels and pine martins have long, thin, very curly poo, so it's all quite variable. And now we'll move on to homes. Are you on homes? Yeah. You are. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, uh, these can often be burrows, really, holes in the ground that you can look out for. Uh, the badger set, as you can see at the top there, it's a quite a big hole, although rabbit holes can often be quite big too, so it can be a bit confusing, but the badger always has an oval hole, and it will be 25 to 30 centimetres wide. Um, and often it, there'll be signs around that there's, there's badger footprints, there's often bedding left outside, and a good amount of excavation often occurs around a badger set, so lots of digging. Rabbit holes are smaller usually uh, and actually round and often can form warrens like the one we see. Um, and then voles and wood mice and other small mammals live in small holes in the ground in all sorts of places. Um, but there are often telltale signs of food remains around the entrance. Um, so that's, that's something that you could look out for. Um, and the next one. That's right. So the nests, um, birds make nests and so, so do small mammals too. So I've got a couple to show you in a minute, but we'll just talk about the nests first. Um, it's difficult to see birds nests at this time of year because there's lots of vegetation and actually with them having eggs and young in them, it's really better to leave them alone. So you could be looking out for them a bit later on when the leaves fall off the trees. Um, it's not always easy to tell when a nest has been abandoned. Uh, if you'd just like to come back, uh, Martin, to me. Yeah. Can you do that? Yeah. I've got a bird's nest here. I've got to put it in the right place so you can all see. I imagine that would have been a blackbird's nest. Can you see it's got like a dip in it and it's sort of made of grass and moss. And that's one that we we found in the winter. So we didn't take it away from the bird, obviously. And this one, this is not a bird's nest. Uh, on the slide, it says that the harvest mice make, makes a, a, a nest the shape of a tennis ball and it suspends it between clumps of grass. Um, and this is what this is. This is the harvest mouse nest. If we just flip back to the side, slide, we'll yeah. see the picture. I've got, I've got, a, I've got one, of the, one of the attendees, Poppy, has got a hand raised. I'm not quite sure. All right. Is, um, just want to, oh, she's gone. <laughs> oh, she did have her hands raised. Maybe that was an accident. Oh, it's gone. She's got her hand down now. Fine, it's fine. I just wanted to check there wasn't some wasn't a problem. So, right, we'll go back to oh. the power boy jam. I've just discovered something. Have you? Oh, yeah. What is it? Oh, well, it's with the nest. <laughs> it's with the nest. What does that look like? It was given to us by one of our conservation officers. Oh, is They've it? clearly found the remains of a mouse in the nest as well. Oh, right, okay. Um, but that was a bit of a shock. I've only just found that, everybody. That's a, a live discovery. 
Oh, well, that's anyway. That's a, a detector, that's a real, true detector of a dead body, Jan. We'll have to mm, see we, it find the cause. We, 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 must, we must assume it was a natural death and that it wasn't murder. Well, we never know. Oh. Investigation. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, I need the slides back, don't I? Yeah. Uh, so the next one. Now we're talking about feeding remains, Martin. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Look, look, look out for leftovers. Um, so these little creatures here, we've got a wood mouse bank roll and a, a grey squirrel. I've just chosen them, and also there's a dormouse mentioned on this slide. I've chosen them because they leave chewed nuts behind, uh, and often around where they kind of they nest, but also in other places too. And you'll see in a film later where we've got some examples of that. Um, so, but they have very now. Now this is one of the quiz questions. This one, so see if you can listen carefully to these. Uh, and see if we can get our question right later. So, the, the difference between what they leave behind. So, the dormouse leaves a, a smooth inner rim in, when the chewed nut, uh, which is pitched at an angle to the shell surface, forming a circular hole. The wood mouse uh, leaves no marks on the surface of the whole nut, uh, a chiselled inner edge, and a circular hole. The bank bowl leaves no gnaw marks on the surface, a chiselled inner edge and a circular hole, and the squirrel just splits the nut in two. Okay, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on to that. that. That was just about chewed nuts, and then there's another picture of something that's chewed. Um, and these are pine cones that have been chewed by squirrels. Uh, I'm going to show you some of both, actually. I have so I've got a little stash of things here at the side, which I keep disappearing off the side. So there's our, oh, we've got it in the right place, Let's get it in the right place. There's our chewed fur cone, okay? Yeah. And this is not a very round hole, actually, but what I can see on this one is it's got very smooth sides, so it's, it's going to have been chewed by a bank bowl. Sorry, it's difficult to just hold that up in the right place. So I think that was bank ball. That's with my detective hat on. Okay, so if we could move on. So we've looked at the fur coat, so now we want to look at the pellets. Okay. Mm. Okay, so many creatures, uh, sorry, many carnivorous birds produce pellets. So this is because they often eat their prey whole and therefore intake non-nutritious body parts such as fur, feathers and bones. So they then regurgitate uh, this matter in the form of a pellet. Um, see the barn owl on the bottom right hand corner doing just that, oh, yes, which yes. leaves a fantastic track or a sign, I should say, uh, that they've been there. Martin wanted to say something. What did you want to say, Martin? No, no, I was, no, I was no, no, you agreeing didn't. with you. Yeah. I was just looking at the, the barn owl dropping the pellet. Yeah, I love that picture. <laughs> so some birds um, have favourite places that, where they do this. The barn owl tends to like to do it around its roosting site. So before it goes to sleep, it regurgitates. So if you ever find a pellet uh, like this, it can be fascinating to soak it and dissect it and see what bones it contains, because this may give you an insight into the bird's diet, which in turn tells you which small mammals are living in the area where the bird lives. Um, so it's kind of a, you can find out more than one sort of clue there, isn't there? So here I have, you can, can, can I challenge you to go back to the screen, Martin? Here I have, this is a barn owl pellet. Now, if you look closely, you can just see that there are some bones in it. Can you see those, especially just there? So the, the, little white, the little white marks on it. That's right, yeah, the little white bits. Um, and if you soak this in water, and I often use a bit of Milton's as well, because it's, you know, for hygiene purposes, uh, they all come away. And uh, what, we, what we do is we count the number of skulls that we find in the pellet. And actually, this is a scientific um, thing. It's not just, it is fun, but it's also science. Um, so we can see how many small mammals our barn owl will have eaten in a night. Okay. And we want it to be about three or four for the barn owl to be healthy and happy. And we also want it to be things like small mammals, voles and, and, and mice, not frogs and birds. It means they're struggling if they're eating things like that. So it gives us a really good clue as to the health of the habitat of the barn owl and how happy the barn owl is really in that habitat. 
So if you yeah. want to be nature detective, you really need to get into poo and regurgitated food, don't you? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, it's a pretty small gross, one. isn't it, really? I think this one's more likely to be a little owl, and I'm actually not sure because it's quite an old one. Again, if we if we had a bit of a dissection, we'd find bits of um, insect remains, wouldn't we, with a, a beetles and things like that with a yeah. with a little owl, because that's what the little owls eat. So we have to take it one step further and, and, and really get delve in there and find out what it contains. Okay. So people who, um, people who go and study these these uh, birds and animals, they go out into the field and look underneath where the barn owl is and stuff into the grass, do they, to find these pellets? Is that what they have to do? Yes, they, yes. Sometimes you just come across them on a, fa you know, underneath a favourite branch. But we, for instance, on the farm where we, you know, well, our headquarters, we've got a few boxes out, and if you've got boxes, that's a good place to look to, to find them underneath because they will deposit them at the end of the day. They're hunting night. They're being nocturnal. They hunt at night. Okay. okay. So, shall we look at the next one? Yeah. Or even more things to look at here. Um. So, so next one. Yeah, so we're into exuvia, that's an exciting word, a new, maybe a new word for you all, I don't know. Um, so the skins of, of larvae, which have been living in lakes and ponds, can be fascinating signs of the presence of certain insect species. When the larvae is ready to make its transition to adulthood, it climbs up the stem of a submerged plant and emerges from its old skin, eventually leaving the skin behind. As you see in the picture, the empty skin is called an exuvia. Dragonfly exuvia are the easiest to spot. Look carefully at the plants that grow up from the water and see if you can find any. And when you're around a pond, especially at this time of year, have a look at the base of those plants and see if you can see any exuvia. Uh, and if you do go very early in the morning on a hot day, you might be lucky enough to see this actually happening. Um, now I have some exuvia. Oh dear, they're very fragile and I'm just trying to pick it up without they look a bit prehistoric, don't they? I'm tipping it out, tipping it out. There we go. There's two in my hand. They do. Um, ooh, right, there's two in my hand. There's a big one, which is easy to see, and a very tiny little one next to it, and that's a damselfly, which is very similar to a dragonfly, much smaller. Um, so let me see if I can separate. Do some tweezers. Should have got some tweezers. Oh, I've dropped it. I've dropped it. There it is. That's the dragonfly one. So I've seen these on them. Um, if you, in pools, on the kind of reeds and grasses next to the edge of a pool is where you can see them sometimes, isn't it? And it's like they look like they're alive, and then you touch it, and it just falls off because there's actually nothing mm -hmm. inside there. So it looks like it's a creature itself, doesn't it? Yeah, but it, it actual fact when it was a, when it was in its larvae stage as a creature it did look a lot like that it you know it doesn't look like that it's just obviously much full of flesh <laughs> whereas it's not now it's just a really fragile so more fragile than paper which is making it a bit difficult for me to handle okay uh we've got how many how many we got left now how many tips have we got, Two got more. not many left now not many all right we've got, now this one so actually this is about, about identifying birds, but, but not by seeing them, but by hearing them and listening to them. Uh, during the breeding season, males, male birds sing to mark their territories, um, and many of the songs are very different. So I'm just going to play three, just a short burst of three. I think I'm uh, up, Martin, I'm up, I'm Martin's going to play me a short burst of three, because I can't control it. Don't let it go on too long, <laughs> just a few phrases. So this is the robin. Okay, uh, blackbird. You can talk to it, Martin. Yeah, this is the blackbird. Up and running. It's quite difficult. It's quite an art to tell the difference between the, the sounds of the birds, isn't it? They all sound the same to me. But... I think some people are maybe better at it than others. I, I, I feel maybe, but it's yeah. well worth a try. Is the song thrush? Now the song thrush repeats itself. Can you see that? That it's doing its phrases three, four, five times. Uh, whereas the blackbird always changes its phrases as it goes along. Um, so that's a sure sign of the difference between those two. 
Robin's just got a slightly different pitch. So, but there's obviously this is a massive subject, and you you, you could learn. Yeah. I, when I first started, I just learned a few every year and built on it. Um, now I'm old; I can identify quite. Now you know them all, don't you? <laughs> no, I don't know them all. <laughs> I don't know them all. Um, so uh, now we're going to the seaside to be an H detective, which is a great place to go. Um, so shells and natural things on the beach can tell the stories to uh, what's out to sea, really. Uh, so look along the strand line. This is the point where the tide reaches its highest before it turns um, and it, it to go back out again. So many shells are deposited there and other natural features. So here are some examples of the sorts of things you might find. Um, there's the cuttlefish shell. You perhaps find some of those on the beach at, at times. It's the bone within the cuttlefish's face. Um, there's the what some people call a mermaid's purse, which is an egg case for rays and sharks. So that suggests that out at sea there are rays and sharks and their egg cases have been washed in. The exoskeleton of a crab uh, or parts of a crab can often be found in this area. Uh, a crab sheds its skin as it grows bigger, so it will leave its exoskeleton behind. Uh, and then egg cases of whelks, they, they often blow around in the wind and they're quite lightweight, but they're a sign that uh, a sea snail is living out in the shallows. Um, so pay attention to these items um, and others give us an indication of what's actually living, like I say, out there in the shallow seas and the deeper seas beyond. Uh, I don't think I'm not anything to show. I'd like to have had a mermaid's purse, but I haven't, so... Oh, well, uh, so you, now I'm just... you know, do you know what, John? It's just as well I'm here, isn't it? I've got this. Oh! You can see this. I'm not even sure I can put it on my screen. You need to go up a bit. Up a bit. Right a bit. Little... Looks very white. Oh, is it an, a sea anemone? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah? Right, so it just looks like a big sweet, doesn't it, at the moment? Or a stone, actually. <laughs> it's got like, see, pin, no. like the star pinprick at the top. But um, you can't really see that very well, but... Yeah, I think it's a sea urchin, actually. Oh, right, yes, 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 maybe it's, yeah. Very fragile. <laughs> you anyway. get those sea potatoes that are a bit like that as well that you, that you see. Was it that sort of thing? Or, uh, no, uh, I think it's just a sea urchin, actually. Okay, so the next uh, slides are just a few useful publications um, that help with being an nature detective. And, um, I've just put a few slides up to show you that you can get ones for helping you with mammal signs, with bird signs, just run through them quite quickly, Martin. And yeah. that there are a lot of books out there which will also help you, some really good books. So um, that's the introduction uh, that, I, that I made. That's just a start. Oh, yes, that was, that was not going to take long at all. Right, so we need to crack on then, don't we? That was really interesting, Jan, and there's plenty, obviously, plenty of things to see with all your sights and sounds. So... I think we've got um, we've got a video, haven't we, next now, where we can see a little bit more about that. So, so this is, um, Kerry went out for a walk to find some tracks and signs, and this is what she found. Okay, let's see what it's like in the, in the real world then. Uh, this one. There we go. Wildlife can often be difficult to spot. However, all, if not most animals, often leave behind tracks and signs, which can tell you what they have been up to. So always keep an eye out for them, as you never know what you might find. Here we have a sparrowhawk kill, most likely the remnants of a pigeon. The lack of carcass indicates a larger mammal has been here too, to help tidy up, maybe a fox. Here we have a stand of hazel coppice, a good food source for small mammals. Under this refuge we found Chew's hazelnuts, most likely by a bank vole, due to the smooth appearance of the shell and lack of serrated edges which is more typical of wood mice. Tunnels in the soil are also present as you can see, which indicate activity. When out walking in your local woodlands or fields, keep an eye out for trails through the undergrowth. This one here is through some bluebells. 
These are often made by low-slung animals, such as rabbits and badgers. This is a badger trail. They travel to and from their sets down these trails when they go out at night to forage for food. As you can see here, we have a freshly dug badger set with lots of loose sand. Also, keep an eye out for latrines, although you're more likely to smell them first. Badgers use these to mark the edges of their territories. This is an unusual find, a nest in the undergrowth most likely a blackbird due to its size. However, they do prefer to nest in hedges and trees to escape ground-dwelling predators. Here is another example of a nest. This one belongs to a grey wagtail. They often choose to nest along rivers or waterways. This hollow in a tree is a perfect spot for woodpeckers. This one in particular is home to a greater spotted woodpecker. It's important to remember that birds nest during the spring and early summer. So if you see a nest, try your best not to disturb it or its contents and please do not touch it. Some of the artifacts creatures leave behind may take a little more finding due to their small size. Such as these damselfly and dragonfly exuvia. They can be found stuck to vegetation emerging from ponds. Exuvia is simply the exoskeletons left behind by the nymphs as they emerge from the pond to begin their adult lives. So no living creatures are left inside. Here is a lovely example of an adult four-spotted chaser sunning itself before hunting. And okay. Martin, yeah. have we got the update on the blackbird's nest? Oh yeah, that's we have actually. I'll put it on for you. There we go, that was it yesterday. Four so that, eggs. That was the nest that was in the film, was it? Yes, it is. The very same. It's got four yeah. eggs. Weirdly, weirdly on the floor, which is really unusual, isn't it, for a blackbird? Yeah, you'd think that a, a fox yeah. or a badger would be in there and take those, wouldn't you? You would. You would. Let's hope that doesn't happen. So, so it, it, it shows that it pays maybe to go back to the same place more than once then, doesn't it? To see, what, to see maybe what you can see. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, once the story starts to build, um, you, can, you can extend it can't you? Now we know that there's some eggs and hopefully there'll be some chicks. So, so, so would you say, is there like a particular time of day when we should go out or does it not really matter? I think you can just keep, keep your eyes open at any time and your ears, you know, and, and nose to the ground and all that. But I think the morning is, is a good time to spot signs of nocturnal animals because there's been less time for their signs to be disturbed or taken, you know, such as the, uh, the kill, sparrowhawk kill. Uh, okay. by something else that comes along so um, but I think any time and, uh, and if you're out and about just keep 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 alert and if we I mean if we do we you know we're picking up poo and pellets and they all sound a bit disgusting I mean should we is there some sort of should we take things with us gloves or something is there a way to do it or do we just grab it and stick it in our pocket yeah you, you could take gloves you know this is a little bit of kit that i mentioned earlier on but um I, I, as long as you wash your hands thoroughly uh, after you've been handling things like that, that that's fine uh, but if you prefer yeah gloves fine okay and then what about if you in your own garden you we're gonna look at how to uh, create a tool to find some tracks aren't we is that is something we can do yeah so we're going to have a little film now which shows you how you can make a mammal tunnel uh, which is uh, a great thing to do and put it out in your garden at night. Um, so if we watch the film first and then we could just mention a couple of things afterwards, that okay. might be best. Okay, let's watch the film. Hello. 
today I'm going to be showing you how to make a small mammal tunnel so that you can identify the creatures living in your garden from the traps and signs that they leave behind. Here's what you'll need. Two large drink cartons. Scissors. Sellotape. A sheet of A4 paper. A sponge. Pencil or pen. Black food colouring. A bottle lid. Peanut butter and bird seed. And a margarine lid. You need to start by cutting both the ends off one of the drinks cartons and one off the other. This creates a blockage at one end of the tunnel. You may need to get an adult to help you do this as you'll be using scissors. Then slot these together and tape to secure. Make sure it's nice and sturdy. Then using your tunnel as a guide, cut the paper to size And you can place this on the bottom of the tunnel by slotting it in there with your hands. Now you need to put your sponge on the margarine lid. Mine's slightly too large so I cut it to size so it would fit nicely without overlapping. You can then place this seed on the sponge for the animals to eat when they come into your tunnel. I then mixed the food colouring with a small amount of water and put this on top of the sponge. This acts as an ink which catches the animal's footprints on the paper. Then slide the lid to the back of your tunnel, trying to keep it level so the seeds don't spill, like so. Then simply place in a wild area of your garden or along a hedgerow which is best. Cover it with leaves or grass or sticks so it blends in with the surrounding environment. This can be left overnight, maybe for a few nights before you get any results. You need to check your tunnel in the morning to see if you have any animals that have left their footprints behind. Here you can see an example of what it might look like. A guide on how to make this and other projects can be found on the Wildlife Trust website under the Wildlife Watch information. Okay, so that's, um, that's brilliant and thanks to Carl and Kerry for making those videos for us to be able to show us really how we do some of these things so it's a matter that's that's fascinating isn't it we can see what's happening at night then can't we because a lot of wildlife comes out when we're asleep doesn't it yes yes that's right um and if you wanted to be maybe seeing if there were hedgehogs around which is the, another really great thing nocturnal animal then you would need to change your bait um put some cat food in in this because they're they're more likely to go for meaty things um, and just one other tip, we did find with that tunnel, because that Kerry's, Kerry lives with me here, she's my daughter, and we put the tunnel out. Um, and we found that if the tunnel was a tunnel and not with a blockage at the end, which the instructions tell you to do, then it seems to work a little bit better. But you have to put the food in the middle of the tunnel then, so that the creatures that, that come in will walk over some of the paper. So that that's just might be a better way of doing it. So what, um, what, what kind of animals have you seen in tunnels when you've made them then? So what, what could people expect to see perhaps? Um, well, obviously we've got bank voles uh, here, bank voles, wood mice. Um, they can be very busy because uh, they come, <laughs> so it can be quite difficult to decipher the, you know, the, the, the footprints really. But um, 
it's quite reassuring just to know there's something around, you know, there's something a bit mysterious around. Um, so, yeah, yeah that's yeah, nice. It's good to see what we can see, isn't it? Right, so we're, we're, we're running a little bit behind time, but that's fine because this is all good stuff and it's all fascinating to see. So we have got a few uh, questions and answers, so I'm just going to have a quick look at them and see if we can answer them. So, so, so Poppy has asked, how many animals are there in the UK, in the world, and what's the most, and what's the rarest animal? Mm. Did you say the UK or the world? In the UK and in the world, that sounds like a very, very, very big question to be asking. How many animals are there in the UK and in the world, and what's the, what's the rare animal? Yeah. Well, I don't think we'd, we'd, anybody would know how many animals there were in the, in the UK or the world. I think that would almost be impossible to answer, wouldn't it? What do you think might be the rarest, Martin? That, that's uh, another uh, interesting one, too. Yeah, uh, I think, um, I think there, there, there's a sort of a categorization of animals in the world. They sort of, uh, they give it names like critically endangered or endangered. So animals such as, a, you know, the panda or the Siberian tiger, those tend to be what you know the sort of more endangered and in in England we, we have animals that aren't quite so endangered so then they're called animals of least concern so if you do want to find out more about that you can you can perhaps look on the internet animals are classified as to how, how rare they are in the world so probably the most rare I, I I'm not sure we can say what the most rare is but there's there's some animals where there's only say 50 or so of them in the world so there are some quite rare animals out there All right, so then one of the teachers has asked the, what the, if the video of the tunnel is available on YouTube. Yes, the, this, uh, this, this webinar is being recorded. So if you, as you've signed up, you'll get an email at the end, which links you to be able to watch it again so you can repeat it. Uh, Ru Ruthie Woods has asked, would you be speaking about snakes and slow worms? Um, is there is, um, is there anything about snakes and slow ones we can tell where they've been? Yes, um, I really tried hard to find a snake skin. Um, the corrugated metal um, thing that you saw us picking up to look for the bank bowl um, evidence under um, can very often have a snake skin under it as well um, because snakes shed their skin, females before they lay eggs, um, males twice a year. Um, and we've got quite a few of those around that we use to have a look and often do find the skin shedded. I don't know where the slow worms shed their skin, Martin. I know that grass snakes and adders do, because uh, slow worms are legless lizards mm. and lizards yeah, don't shed their skin. So what you need uh, is a nature detective to go and investigate whether they do, Jan. Yes, uh, I would say they don't but i'm not saying that for sure so <laughs> i'm wrong okay, <laughs> i will okay. do some detective work <laughs> okay rosie tyler asks a question which is an interesting one for you jan what's your favorite animal my favorite animal your favorite animal oh it's that would be impossible wouldn't it it might be might be charlie my dog down here <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's because i know him very well but i know i do i love wildlife so it's very very difficult to at the moment, like I say, my favourite is the is the baby woodpeckers in my garden. They are just so funny. They're yeah, so funny with their great, little red heads. Great when you can see them. So Susan Bliss has asked, are robin's eggs always blue? I don't know whether she means blackbird's eggs because that was the nest that you showed. Yeah, they, well, yes, they are. You, they are always the same. Yeah. Um, yeah because whatever bird it is, we'll lay... Um, you can identify birds by their nests and the eggs that they lay. Uh, so um, but the trouble is with that is that you don't really encourage it because you should really leave them alone. So, um, yeah. So you were just lucky, weren't you? Well, it was just, yeah, just a case whereby it was noticed as they were passing um, that they saw the nest on the ground. So it is, it is worth reiterating that, that, you know, birds' nests, it's actually, um, actually against the law to go and take eggs from a bird's nest. So if you, if you do see them, just look at them and enjoy them, but don't, don't ever try and take them. Um, so another, another attendee has asked, how do you stop hedgehogs getting stuck in your mammal tunnel? Oh, uh, make sure it's big enough. We used some pretty big containers there. Um, so don't make it too small. Um, so the, you oh, sorry, you go on. Think, you don't think a hedgehog would try and get into that to nibble on the peanut butter? Uh, I think it would like peanut butter, but I think it would be much more interested in some meaty cat food. Um, but the, it does need 
to be a big quite a big don't use tiny little um cartons use nice nice big ones right it wouldn't say the hedgehog would it, it would it would it try and get into a space that was too small for it or is it or is it more intelligent um, yeah it would i think <laughs> i think it would do i've seen pictures of hedgehogs tied up in all sorts of awful things and you know litter being a problem with them and those drinks tops and things like that so uh, the ones that hold four cans together you know that sort of thing you've seen yeah. those kinds so, of problems so, just be yeah. careful just be careful yeah so, thomas the i mean the thing is if you, you would obviously check it every single if you put it out you must check it you must check it in the morning yeah just so, in case yeah. something like that had happened and then you'd be able to rescue them but don't yeah do we've check got, it uh, oh gosh the questions are coming in thick and fast we've just got um one more time for one more question i think which is thomas who asks what's the largest wild animal currently living in the uk oh what do you think martin i would think it's a, a red bat? deer a what a red deer oh a red deer yeah i was thinking of mammals and yeah they red yeah. deer yes it's, and look what i've got here jan is that some sort of Han antler it's an antler i don't i don't know that it's off a red deer but um yeah i've got i've got an antler upstairs i could have brought it down couldn't i yeah just like it was prime. go and get it whilst we're doing the quiz go and get it <laughs> was it a, is it a giant antler <laughs> it is yeah it is oh, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> right. if we finish the questions i'll run and get it um well, there's just a couple more if we can get quiz, quiz. Okay. What, what, what color are, are what color are robin's eggs susan asked do you know what color robin's eggs are yeah, I think I think the blue. I'm I'm, I'm not an expert on on nests because I like to leave them alone, but I do think they're blue because I had I found a nest in a, a plant pot in my pot store, um, and they were blue and they were tiny, and I just thought this is typical of a robin to do something like this, you know, because you they they put they put the nests in some very odd places. They you have do. to be careful. <laughs> Shed and some final shoes. Question, and... Final question about how to attract hedgehogs into your garden. Oh, that's a, there are ways. I mean, you, the, the hedgehog will range at least a square mile. So you must be, must be able to get in and out of your garden unless you've got a huge garden. Um, so having holes in fences, um, gaps through hedges, um, you must have the right habitat for a hedgehog to live there. They obviously like to eat insects. So a good varied um, vegetation and places for them to hide. They like to hibernate in piles of sticks and the deep hedges and things like that so just having a really good habitat but i mean that's um that's quite a big subject isn't it martin would you say you're, you're more of a hedgehog expert aren't you mm, not today <laughs> you, I'm, i've got a, my detectives hat on today you did a survey you did a fantastic survey on the farm a few years ago um where we are headquarters and what did we find out there were no we, we put them out once every every day was it seven days the tunnels yeah. Yeah. And what did you find out? There weren't any hedgehogs there. Unfortunately, the hedgehogs are in fine, and there 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 aren't as many as there used to be. So they're they're more endangered than we realised. Okay, we're we're rapidly running out of time here. So um, just as the final thing we want to do is to is to give you a little quiz, just to see um, have a little bit of fun and see how much you've learned. So uh, what we're going to do is the, the the questions will come up on your screen. And all you've got to do is to click on the answer that you think is right. So we'll, we'll run through these pretty quickly, but the first one should be coming up now on your screen. If you click on the answer that you think is right, then, uh, then we can move on. It looks like, okay, so the question is, badgers live underground and go in and out of their homes through large oval holes, okay? Just give a few more seconds if people want to try and answer that one and then we'll end the poll. Okay, we've still got a few people answering. Nearly all the way there. Okay, we'll leave that one there. Most people have got that one true. I think we'll find that's the right answer. So let's just see, we'll share the results. Okay, so most people got that one right. Nice, easy one to start with. Okay, let's try another one another question is it gone okay okay another one coming up so if you find a hazelnut and it has gnaw marks on the surface and a chiseled inner edge and a circular hole what's it being nibbled by is it being nibbled by a wood mouse a hedgehog 
or a weasel? Wood mouse, a hedgehog, or a weasel? Remember, Jan mentioned these in the in the presentation that she gave. Answers are coming in. Most people are getting thinking it's a wood mouse. Nobody thinks it's a weasel. Or a Mr. Weasel. Maybe he fancies a bit of a hazelnut now and again. Okay, so we'll end that one. We'll see how you got on. Uh, we'll just share the results with that one. Nearly everyone got that one right, that it was a, it was a wood mouse. Okay, we'll just put maybe a couple more questions up because we are running a little bit over, over time. So we'll launch another one now. Uh, where are you most likely to find bat poo? Where are you most likely to find bat poo? Is it anywhere? Is it at the foot of a tree? Or is it on the ground beneath a roost? Click on the answer that you think is right. Coming in now, answers. Most people are thinking it's on the ground beneath the roost. Just give a couple more seconds for that one. So they let get your answers in and let's see what we get. Share the results. The answer for that one is on the ground beneath the roost and nearly everybody got that one right. So that's really good going. You've obviously been listening well today. We'll just try two more questions, I think. Uh, let's try this one. Dormice, oh, I haven't launched it yet, anyway. uh, Dormice live in small tennis ball shaped nests suspended between clumps of grass. Is that true or false? Dormice live in small tennis ball shaped nests suspended, suspended between clumps of grass. Most people are going for true on that one. Give you, let's give you a bit more time to answer that one. And uh, we'll just leave it there. We'll share the results. So most people thought that was true, but actually the answer is false. So it's not suspended between, is it in between clumps of grass? Jan's looking at me in a funny way. That is right, isn't it, Jan? It's not in between clumps of grass. It's, it's the uh, harvest mouth. It's the harvest it? mouth. So it's in the, in the branches of the trees. Mm. So it's a bit of a tri tricky question that because they do live in tennis ball shaped nests, but it's not suspended between clumps of grass. Now then, just before I launch the last question, this is a bit of a, a one to see how observant you've been today. Um, you just need to have a quick look at the screen behind me, have a quick peruse because the answer is going to be, the answer to the next question is on the screen behind me. So I'm just going to give you a couple of seconds to look at there and then I'm going to launch the question and see if you can get the answer right. Here we go. How many toes does a frog have? Is it three, four or five? <laughs> How many toes does a frog have? We'll just give that one a few more seconds. Remember to look behind me if you want to know what the answer is. I can't see because of the things on in front of it. Oh, is I don't it? Know whether else. Yeah, I don't know whether everyone else is seeing the same as oh, me. Yeah. Maybe, maybe they can't maybe see. <clears throat> okay, so we'll end the poll there and we'll share the results. The answer is four. You can see, I can get this right now. Where am I? Stop sharing. Uh, close that one. The frog. Bit difficult. I like the 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 hair. There we go. Frog. There we go. And there's going to be <laughs> sunshine coming over from the west and some rain in Scotland. <laughs> um, so that is, that's, that's, that's all we've got time for today. In fact, it's more than we've got time for. But Jan, what have you got to show us there? That's the antler. That is the antler from the animal, which is the largest in the, I think in the UK. Red deer antler, yeah. It's out of my daughter bedroom so I'm not entirely sure where she got it from she must have found it somewhere I think that's Kerry on H detective right. so that's that's another that's another thing you can you can you can find those can't you on the ground in the rotting season when they've fallen off so it's you know those are that's a good find so so I, unfortunately our time is finished today we have run a bit over over time but I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've been able to you've been able to share and inspire with you something that you can do with wildlife now you can get out there and try and track some of these signs or you can make one of those um, those tunnels and and see some wildlife some secret wildlife for yourself and 
hope we've, we've given you some tips on how to be a great nature detective. And um, remember, if, if you've signed up today, we will be sending you a link to, how to, to some um, um, pages on the website, which will tell you more about how to make these things and some further information about today. And if you do want to watch it again, uh, well, the link will be on there as well. Just one final reminder that, um, that, that at the moment, the Wildlife Trust is running a thing called 30 Days Wild, which is uh, encouraging each one of us to go and do something outdoors, go and do something wild every day in June. So if you want to be part of that and you want to have some inspiration about what you can do, again, look at your um, Wildlife Trust website and there should be some information on there. And the final thing before we go, we have one last question. We'd just like to get some feedback from you as to whether this has been fun or whether it's been a complete waste of time and I should hang my detective's hat up. So we have a one last poll, which basically is a, is a feedback poll where just tell us whether you think we're a five gang or a one gang. So I'm going to launch the poll now and then just put in how much you've enjoyed today, whether it's uh, been fun or, or not, and we can just feed that back. So that'll be really helpful if you can do that. Okay, we'll just give a few more seconds for those to come back. Okay, that's great. We'll end the poll there. Oh, sorry if you wouldn't have a chance, but we're in a bit of it. Okay, we share the results. So mostly it's all looking pretty good for us, Jan. We can maybe come back again yeah. another time. You've passed the test. Brilliant. There go the dogs. <laughs> Perfect timing. Perfect timing. I'm anyway, going to mute so, it. So, so thank you all. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed that. Remember, there'll be some information if you want to catch it up and do, doing it, do it at home and, and see in your own time. So thank you for joining us and hopefully see you again on another webinar. Goodbye. <laughs>